So our next speaker is Jeff Dean. He's a Google Senior Fellow. And since 1999, he has co-designed and implemented quite a few different generations of Google's uh, infrastructure for crawling and index and query serving. He's responsible for key distributed computing infrastructure like GFS, MapReduce, Bigtable, and Spanner. He uh, received the Mark Weiser Award with Sanjay Gemawat in 2012. And today he's going to be talking about the rise of cloud computing systems. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I'd like to point out that I'm going to be describing the work of literally thousands of people across many, many different companies and academic institutions. So uh, this is not clearly my work necessarily. Um, so I'd like to start back with Multics, which had this vision of utility computing. And I think that's a really nice notion that the ability to have computing power on, on tap when you need it uh, and to multiplex uh, many users of that computing power was a really good way to give everyone kind of the computing power they needed uh, when they needed it. Um, over time, however, what happened was utility computing proved to be decentralized because PCs became very cheap and then everyone could have their own uh, workstation or microcomputer. Uh, it was actually one of the early Google clusters when it was a Stanford grad project. Um, and so you uh, end up with this, uh, this decentralized collection of machines. Um, but over time, we've kind of gone back to this centralized notion. So we have now very, very large facilities with li literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers inside them. And Part of that is because we now have very powerful high-speed networks, and we've figured out how to build this centralized utility out of individual small components. So what I'm going to tell you is kind of how we got to that point. Uh, so prior to the 90s, uh, as actually Ken discussed, their distributed systems tended to emphasize kind of relatively small-scale systems, you know, three to five replicas of things. Uh, a modest scale system in a local area network, or these widely distributed but decentralized systems. They didn't tend to focus very much on having a huge number of computers in one place and doing stuff with them. Uh, there are a couple of adjacent fields that are kind of related to, to this. So one is the, the field of high performance computing, which has obviously a very high, heavy focus on performance. You might expect that it being in the title. Um, but not so much on fault tolerance. So basically those were using very high-end supercomputer machines to do complex uh, simulation kinds of things. And if the machine failed, well, you'd kind of restart from a checkpoint and off you went. Uh, and then transactional systems and database systems, which had a really strong emphasis on structured data and on consistency, uh, but kind of a limited focus on these really large-scale data sets, especially at low cost. They'd be willing to sell you one, but uh, you'd have to pay a lot for it. Uh, and, and it didn't necessarily scale to the size of data sets you, you might want if you had a really large amount of data. Okay, so in uh, the caveats that many other speakers have also given, this is a really uh, difficult thing to do in 25 minutes, so I'm gonna cover some of the important areas and developments in this thing. I'm going to skip some stuff, obviously, and I'm gonna describe the context behind systems uh, when I'm familiar with them. Okay, so what caused the need for these really large-scale systems? Uh, and I contend that actually one of the first publicly available incredibly large data sets was the web. So the ability to have this incredibly large data set that actually had kind of looser consistency requirements than a lot of other large data problems at the time was a key driver for the development of some of these really large scale computational infrastructure. Basically the web grew from millions to hundreds of billions of pages and you needed to be able to index it all and then search it really fast. And be, by requiring that you search it really fast, you actually need parallelism across a very large number of computers. And that, I think, is one of the things that led to the solutions that you, you see today. Um, so one of the earliest projects that kind of recognized that a bunch of computers plus a high-speed network would actually be a pretty powerful thing, you can see it kind of swallowing up mainframes and vector computers there, uh, was the Berkeley Now project, which kind of made this argument that uh, computers are getting cheaper and by networking them together in the same facility, you can actually get a tremendous amount of computing power applied to, to problems that you might care about. Uh, and that actually led to the founding of Inktimi, uh, which sort of used this approach as uh, one of the 
uh, early uh, search engines using networks of workstations, you know, Sun workstations. Um, so my vantage point to starting this was I joined DeckWorld. I'm actually a compiler person uh, from uh, my graduate studies. Uh, but I joined DeckWorld because there were lots of interesting systems uh, problems going on. And uh, at, around that time, some people at Deck had gotten together and uh, produced a prototype that eventually turned into a commercial service called AltaVista, which was another early search engine. And they were using it kind of as a showcase for these really high-end Deck Alpha machines and some really incredibly clever software that Mike Burroughs had written to, to search uh, inverted indices really fast. So uh, actually, at the time that I joined Whirl, uh, AltaVista was still housed in our facility, and so they kept kind of adding more and more of these, these refrigerator-sized computers, including behind our gym, and you had to be kind of careful to avoid kicking the plug out on one of these things as you were... <laughs> and eventually they moved out, and they continued to add more and more of these refrigerator-sized uh, computers as they scaled. Um, so that's one of the real beauties of these systems is with the relaxed consistency, you can just add machines to add capacity to your system, and the relaxed consistency requirements are kind of nice in that respect. Um, so eventually, I decided I wanted to go to a small company, and I joined Google, and uh, <laughs> it was pretty small at the time. We're, we're not so small anymore. Uh, and one of the early Google tenets was that workstations were cheap, but hey, PCs were even cheaper. And they give those PCs basically you're riding this commodity wave of you know hundreds of millions of components being produced every year, and that's going to give you the highest performance per dollar because the economies of scale are there. And in fact, if you uh, dispensed with the cases and the uh, manufacturing middleman, if you bought commodity components and assembled them yourself, you could do even better. Uh, so this is our earliest uh, such design in the house. Um, it actually had some unfortunate properties, including the fact that it had four motherboards sharing a single power supply, which is perhaps an unwise solution. <laughs> uh, it also had a thin layer of cork, which insulated the four motherboards from the cookie tray that the machine sat on. Uh, as an aside, if you use cork, you can land on the Smithsonian in your computing platform. <laughs> um, so at a modest scale, you can actually treat all these machines as just separate machines that you can use to run stuff on. So when I joined Google, there was a uh, readme file in the root directory. And it had like obtuse shell commands like this that were pasted. And it was like, you know, literally 3,000 lines of shell commands that you could like execute to do stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like being your own sysadmin for a bunch of machines. Like my favorite A9 machine is doing good stuff for me. Uh, but you kind of notice that over time, A11 and A15 have like fallen out, fallen by the wayside. <laughs> and you know, doing this is pretty painful. So, and at a larger scale, it becomes even more painful. So once you have hundreds of machines or thousands of machines, this is really kind of untenable to kind of individually manage all of them. So uh, this is kind of from a bit later in Google's uh, uh, development, but this is the typical first year problems you see in a, at a cluster, which is kind of a scale of maybe 10,000 machines. These are the kinds of problems that cluster sees in its first year. It's like. Uh, formative years, as you were. Uh, it gets a little better after that. And we've actually gotten a lot better at building clusters, so it's not quite so bad these days. But you can see there's all kinds of problems, uh, both individually within the building and within the network. And uh, those are actually all problems that have knocked out long distance links for us. You know, wild dogs, sharks, dead horses, and drunken hunters. Um, so you could buy slightly more reliable machines. But you'd still have all those problems, just a bit less frequently, right? Like if you had redundant power supplies and that kind of thing, machines wouldn't fail quite as often. But ultimately, when you're operating at a certain scale, you really have to have reliability come from the software, because you're going to have failures of a wide and disparate uh, flavor. OK, so I'm going to describe a series of steps that all have this common theme, which is to provide a higher level view than a large collection of individual machines. Uh, and part of that is these systems need to self-manage and self-repair as much as possible. Um, so one of the things you first want to do when you have a bunch of machines is, gee, I'd like to store stuff. And uh, so you'd like to be able to have a distributed file system that runs across all the disks in the machine and gives you the illusion that there's like one file system instead of 10,000. 
Um, there's a long history of distributed file systems, and I'm not going to cover it all here. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of file servers of various kinds with a bunch of distributed clients all sharing a single centralized server. Uh, there's systems like AFS, which has thousands of clients and does caching to give the um, uh, better performance, basically. It's weakly consistent. Uh, and a whole bunch of other, a host of other systems. Um, what we needed in the centralized facility with lots and lots of machines is we wanted a file system with very high bandwidth. And we controlled the applications and were developing the file system at the same time. So that allowed us to make a few different trade-offs. So one of the things about the Google file system, which I actually was only a design consultant on, my uh, colleagues Sanjay Gamawat, Howard Gobioff, and Shantak Byung uh, published a paper in SOSP03 about this. Uh, and we made some somewhat dif different de design decisions in this. So the first is that there's a centralized master that manages all the metadata for the file system, but doesn't manage any of the data. Um, people thought that wouldn't scale, but that actually turned out to scale reasonably well. Um, and then the clients are running on the same machines as all the file system data. Uh, so there's a uh, chunk server that runs on every one of these machines that has disks that sort of mediates client access to those disks, and the clients talk directly to that. And that gives you a tremendous amount of I.O. bandwidth to read and write to the file system, and you do metadata operations to the master. And we use this notion of replication, simple three-way replication onto three different servers on, th on three different racks, ideally. In case you have a rack failure, you want the data to be available. Um, and basically, the ma master was responsible for coordinating re-replication and so on to make sure that every file system chunk always had three copies or if it didn't, to get it back up to three copies. And that basically gives the, the uh, system the property that the disks in the data center become self-managing. So you now have this nice file system. It just kind of runs. You don't have to worry about machine failures, disk, fail disk failures. You just kind of do a weekly sweep to replace disks, and they, they start getting used again. Um, one of the design patterns that came out of that was that having a centralized master for metadata and control and having workers and clients communicate directly for the bulky stuff was actually pretty, pretty useful. People thought it wouldn't scale, but it turned out to be pretty useful in a lot of different systems down the road. Um, once you store data, then you actually want to do stuff with it. So um, if you have a lot of data on your disks, obviously that implies the need that you probably want to do something computationally expensive with it as well. And so that implies that you need uh, parallel computation on that data. Um, and so one important building block I'm not going to talk too much about is just how do you schedule these computations. And they often have hundreds or thousands of different tasks, where a task is something that runs on a single machine. Uh, you can represent a task as either a virtual machine, which a lot of people favor, where you have this nice uh, virtualized uh, resource that you can move around, or as containers, which are sort of like a VM, but at the process level, they're not as heavyweight as running a whole operating system, but they have kind of a controlled environment of, of what that process is supposed to run in and what sort of files are supposed to be available to it locally. Um, so virtual machines have already been uh, nicely covered by Andrew Herbert. Uh, as he said, there was a lot of early work and then kind of a, a lull, and then they were reinvigorated by Ed Bunyon and Mendel Rosenblum and others in the late 90s to simplify uh, using a multiprocessor effectively. And also that allowed consolidation of servers, because you can run lots of different VMs on the same physical machine. And I'll point out that raw VMs are now a key abstraction offered by these public cloud service providers. Basically, you get your own VM. It looks like a computer to you, and off you go. Um, and so the cluster scheduling system's job, whether it's containers or VMs, is to place these tasks on physical machines in the data center and to handle different resource requirements and constraints that you might have, uh, like I might need 10 gigabytes of memory or I might need you know, uh, 16 cores worth of compute computation, um, and to handle machine failures. Um, this is similar to earlier HPC scheduling and distributed workstation scheduling, except it's all on a big centralized facility. Uh, Condor is a good example of one of these workstation scheduling systems. Um, and I'll point out that there's, there's an awful lot of these scheduling systems. Uh, we have one at Google called Borg that's been in use uh, since 2004. We had an earlier system uh, since 2002. Um, pretty much every company seems to have one. Uh, there's a bunch of open source ones. I don't think there's a real good standardization of, of this, but they're all conceptually pretty similar. You want to schedule stuff, and it does it. Um, 
I'll point out that there's a tension between multiplexing resources. You want to run lots of stuff on each physical machine so that you get good utilization. You don't have to buy as many machines. But that causes a lot of tension because then you're not as performance isolated uh, as you'd like to be. If you had your own machine for your VM, then great, you have the whole, whole machine and can burst and use all of it when you want. Um, and so there's a bunch of work, I think, on isolating uh, resources within a machine while still sharing them. So memory ballooning work by Carl Waldsberger, for example, in OSDI 2002, the Linux containers work that's been uh, added to the Linux uh, uh, kernel relatively recently. recently. And also when you have these really wide fan out systems where you have thousands of tasks cooperating for interactive systems, it's really hard to control tail latency because at any given point, one of those machines is doing something you don't want it to do and it's doing some, some other uh, person's work. And uh, that's really, that causes all kinds of weird tail blips for your latency. Okay. Uh, so a bunch of individual tasks is kind of useful, but it's actually nicer to not have to think about that as much. And so there's a bunch of uh, ways that you can give programmers much higher levels of abstraction than, uh, okay, here's a bunch of uh, raw VMs or whatever, go for it. Um, and you really want to map this high-level computation automatically onto a big cluster of machines. So uh, MapReduce is one example of this uh, that uh, Sanjay and I developed where you have this simple map and reduce abstraction and the user writes a map function and reduce function and it's known to operate in a particular way and then that allows you to hide the messy details of how you're actually gonna map that computation onto a bunch of machines in the cluster automatically and it can handle scheduling and locality so it can try to run the map tasks next to the data that it's processing. Uh, it can deal with slow machines by re-executing things uh, and it makes it really actually quite easy for people not familiar with distributed systems to write really large scale computations and run them on a thousand machines. Every intern season we have an enormous usage spike of like people running random thousand machine jobs on our uh, clusters. And that's because it's easy. Uh, and Hadoop of course is an open source version of MapReduce uh, developed based on the paper that we published. Uh, and that's been pretty successful in, in helping a lot of people do these kinds of computations in their environment. And there's a, been a succession of other kinds of higher level computation systems. So Dryad uh, essentially generalized uh, the map reduce notion to general data flow graphs and mapped those onto large numbers of machines. There's a bunch of systems, Sawzall, Pig, Dryad, Link, and Flume that all use a higher level domain specific language or uh, system and then use um, MapReduce or Hadoop or whatever underneath the covers as the execution engine for those things. Uh, Pregel is something that's specialized more for graph uh, algorithms. Essentially you write code for nodes and edges and so on and then it maps that onto there. Spark has this notion of in-memory working sets which is often useful for iterative kinds of computations. So there's a lot of these. I think there's going to be more in that uh, giving programmers this high level view and then having the flexibility of an implementation mapping that onto the underlying hardware is a lot better. It sort of frees them from the difficult computation that, that Franz was t talking about. Uh, at the same time, many applications in these uh, cloud environments started to want to be able to update structured state. So it's not just read-only data. You now want to be able to have structured state that you update with low latency, and the scale is actually quite big. So you have some, uh, something that could naturally be a database table, but you want to run it over thousands of machines and that, that uh, system often grows and shrinks as the, the size of the underlying data grows. Um, and you want to be able to spread that data over lots of machines uh, and handle machine failures quickly. And a lot of these applications often prefer low latency and high performance over strict consistency. Uh, so. I'll talk about three, there are several, there are a bunch of others, but uh, one of the earliest ones was Bigtable, which was developed by um, a bunch of people, including myself at Google. And that basically was a high level storage system that had this notion of rows, columns, and timestamps on top of, a, of GFS. So it now gives you the view that you have rows and columns, you can update any, it's like a big table. <laughs> I believe in simple names, but um, it didn't give any cross-row consistency guarantees, so that was one of the ways it gave up on consistency. And then the state was managed in a bunch of little small pieces we called tablets that 
made recovery fast. So a given machine in the system would manage tens to hundreds of tablets. And then when a machine died, a hundred other machines could each pick up one of the tablets that that machine was managing and recover very quickly. And that was good because we're actually using these for interactive applications uh, that are, you know, users are waiting for these requests to happen. Uh, Dynamo uh, was already mentioned by uh, Ken, I think. Uh, that has a really nice, interesting property of relaxed consistency, but allows users or the programmers to specify a application-assisted um, conflict resolution mechanism. Um, and then after a few more years, we realized that a typical big table instance would run in one data center, but then we would run many of them in different data centers. And what we really wanted was a storage system that ran in all of our data centers and provided consistency across that and could move data from one data center to another so that as Belgium filled up, you could like shuffle data to Munich and that kind of thing. Um, and so that was, that was Spanner. And one interesting property about Spanner is we actually support strong consistency. So it's not required. You can specify on an operation by operation basis what consistency level you want. But we found that omitting it from big table, people would reinvent strong consistency mechanisms and often do them wrong on top of big table. So uh, we put them in. Uh, right, so one successful design pattern that, I, that is actually used in MapReduce and Bigtable and a bunch of other systems is to give each machine hundreds or thousands of units of worker state, and that helps with load balancing and faster failure recovery and dynamic capacity sizing. So if you add machines to your system, they can uh, pick up some of the load. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the public cloud. So, over the last sort of six or seven years, maybe eight or nine years, these systems are now starting to become available to developers everywhere. Uh, and I think that's a really Im important concept. So cloud service providers basically make these services available and leverage the economies of scale in these large data centers um, for anyone with a credit card. And they leverage the economies of scale across lots of users of that system, which are independent organizations and people. And that's why these facilities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they're aggregating all the demand, not just of an individual company, but of you know, dozens and hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of people. Um, so a quick run, rundown of cloud service providers. Amazon was a pioneer in this area. Uh, they've really done a good job, I think, in producing things. So they offered an queue API, but they're, the main thing that, that really launched them to being useful was EC2, which essentially gives you VMs. So you get a VM and you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, Google started with a somewhat different strategy which was App Engine which is much higher level of abstraction and said you write your program in this style and we'll take care of running it and scaling it across lots of machines. That worked really well if what you wanted was to write a program that fit into that programming style but often people wanted low level VMs because they wanted to do something different. Um, and I think over time there's gonna be both low-level VMs and high-level programming models that'll, that'll be there. Uh, and Microsoft is also in this with Azure. Uh, millions of customers are using these services. So I think Amazon reported they have more than a million cu paying customers for these things. And the shift towards these services is actually accelerating over time. And the other thing is the comprehensiveness of what you can do in these services is also increasing. You know, they started out at Amazon with VMs, and now there's all kinds of much higher level things. Uh, there's machine learning services, there's, you know, the ability, uh, Microsoft has the ability to take a photo and give you tags. So all these things are, you know, much higher level convenience services for programmers, and it, it's pretty cool. Uh, so where are we? Okay, so we've got a pretty good handle on how to take a collection of a bunch of machines in a building and to make them into a useful set of uh, layered services. So we have, at the lowest level, a distributed file system, which allows you to access the disks on the individual machine and treat things as a file system. And that's pretty useful. And a cluster scheduling system allows you to run stuff. That's pretty good, too. Uh, and then we have these higher level programming models. We have these higher level structured storage systems. We have a whole bunch of other services that run on top of these, these basic uh, uh, primitive features. And then there's the public access to all this stuff, which is, is pretty cool. And that's where we are. What do I think is next? I think there's two interesting areas, not to say these are the only two, but I think one of the things that's very complicated today is putting together 
systems with hundreds of subsystems. So our search service, for example, runs you know, probably 500 different services uh, that are touched on every query. And the configuration for that is very, very complicated and is not very self-managing. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there for less configuration and much more automated operation of these things. And I think because of the kind of decline of Moore's Law, I won't say quite the end, but the decline of it, um, there's going to be a lot more heterogeneity as people produce specialized hardware to do things. You already see this with GPUs. Microsoft is experimenting with FPGAs and data centers. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And figuring out how to deal with heterogeneity at a systems level where you have a computation you want to do, and then you want to map that onto whatever heterogeneous collection of devices you have is going to be interesting. So uh, thanks for listening, and thanks to those people for comments on this presentation. Um, anyone have a question for Jeff? Here. Here uh, can I comment on Stonebreaker's uh, opinions of map reduce? And I, think <laughs> recently, uh, I think he recently said he was right because you did banner or something like that. So uh, Dave Patterson asks for uh, your opinion on Stonebreaker's uh, comments. On yeah. Um, I mean, I, I kind of see MapReduce as a pretty useful tool, and it's not incompatible with database systems. For example, we run MapReduces that read data out of databases or out of storage systems like uh, Bigtable and Spanner and then write data back into to it. I think what's interesting about MapReduce is that it makes those computations easy to express and fault tolerant, and often you're running things that are much more complicated than you can easily express in a language like SQL on 10,000 machines, and you want them to be vault tolerant. So I think MapReduce kind of makes it easy to do those kinds of computations. It's not to say there aren't other ways of doing that, but I, I still think it's a pretty useful tool. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Here's our oh, sure. thank you very much. You're welcome.